view to boosting local and international investments. The combination of his hard work, wisdom, and transparency has left an indelible mark in the Lebanese Businessman Association, RDCL, which he presided from 2011 until 2016. In 2017, he was elected president of the Association of Lebanese Business People in the World, RDCL World, CEO of Zimco Group in the Middle East and Africa, Dr. Zmukhul continues to share his secrets of success and motivational insights as professor at both USG and LAU. A keynote speaker at national, regional, and international conferences, he wrote various publications and research papers. He also sits on the board of several local and international institutions. Last but not least, it gives me great pleasure to present to you a dear friend and my very own professor, at the Executive MBA program, Dr. Fuad Zmikhal. But before I leave the floor to you, Dr. Ladi would like to say a few words about you. Good evening, We as a faculty, we received the biggest kick when we see one of our own has done a better job than what we did. And I'm here to celebrate the success of a friend of mine, I call him Fuad by, the, by his first name. Years ago, Fuad was in my class, and he has always intrigued me by the way he challenged class. He came in with a counter argument, with a counter theory. He, he has a way of solving problems, of rallying people around him. And here I thought, as I move from class to class, Fuad is always there. I thought he's in class because he liked the instruction and my teaching style. It happened that he likes Joel, who was taking the class, and he was trying to go in the heart of Joel. Fuad, now, now I know the tricks works. Fuad, we at LAU, we love you dearly. And you are one of us who have done a very good job. We are, we are proud of you, and we want you to continue to inspire these young men and women to show them the way uh, as to how they could do it. And we wanted to become, to follow your footsteps, and to become as achiever, as successful as you did. Ahla wa sahla feek, welcome home. Ahla wa sahla feek. Good evening, everyone. I have to be extremely honest uh, and to tell you that I'm honestly speechless. I'm speechless because my heart is beating. My heart is beating because I feel home. I feel home because... LAU was my second home. I'll give you a secret because you have touched me. When I graduated from school and I went to AUB, I went to AUB because I wanted to become an engineer. And at that time, and this is not in my presentation, I lost my dad. I lost my dad and I had to move to the business school because I wanted to take part-time courses. And during that, there was a lot of politics and it was impossible to move from engineering to to the business school because there's problems between deans and this was completely new for me. I was coming out of university and I want to move because I wanted to travel and this I couldn't do it. I came to BUC. I came to BUC because they've opened me the doors. They told me, we want you in. We want somebody, we want to teach you. We want to hold you by the hands. And professor like Dr. Ladi and many others stayed with me. I told them, but I cannot attend courses. I want to work. Because I have to work to pay my university. And I did. I did. I was just a couple of minutes from here. And I was working like 24 hours. Paying my university and coming back. So believe me, my heart is beating. Because I'm coming back to discuss not about my story. But to discuss about crisis management. Why? Crisis management. When I was called by, uh, where is Abdullah? He is Abdullah. He told me, I, mean, I called him. I said, let's do something on crisis management in Lebanon. So thank you very much for inviting me. And then Rada called me, said, you want to send a PowerPoint presentation? And I mean, I received the guy said, PowerPoint presentation on crisis management in Lebanon? Is this possible? Impossible. Can, how can I do it? Maybe on my way here, and this is exactly what happened, I might change my presentation because everything is moving extremely quickly. 
can we give a course on crisis management? We can. Can we give a course on crisis management in Lebanon? Of course we cannot. We can live through, we can overcome it, and we can fight it. And we cannot teach it because we have this in our genes. We are Lebanese. The first thing, yes, uh, yes, okay, thank you. So give me time. So when we want to do, discuss about crisis management, and I'm sure we all as alumni, we know that the first thing we have to do is to divide the title. When we divide the title and we become, we say, Lebanon. Wherever you go in the world and you say, I am Lebanese, you receive two major feedback. The first thing, and de depending where you go, said, wow, you're Lebanese. We love your nightlife. We love to come and have great times here. We hear a lot of stuff about your lifetime. So this is option A. But at the same time, you're here. Oh, Lebanon, is the war finished? Are you still under war? Are you still under conflict? We saw on the news some battles. So these are the two options that we we'll always listen as being Lebanese. So when we say Lebanon, unfortunately, or maybe fortunately, Lebanon equal crisis. When we go and we say Crisis management 11. Management. Yes, you are instructor of management. What can we do without management? We manage growth, but at the same time, we have to manage failure. We have to manage bankruptcy. We have to face it. We have to manage success, which is extremely important because if you don't manage success, you can fall down. But at the same time, we have to learn how to manage failure and downfall and to accept it. Not to be in the denial mode we are. So yes, when we say Lebanon, we will say crisis. And we say management, we will say strategy. We will say plan. We will say structure. We will say process. So crisis management in Lebanon means doing a complete deep process and a structural mind. When we go into crisis, the word crisis, you know what the crisis means? in Chinese. Anyone who knows what is the crisis in Chinese? And please Google it to make sure that what I'm saying is correct. Crisis in Chinese means two words. <laughs> corona, yes, but what is Corona? It's danger, so watch up. We have a danger, but at the same time, it means opportunity. And this is the definition of crisis in Chinese. So first, it's saying danger. It's not saying downfall. It's not saying bankruptcy. It's not say that we stop working, we stop living. So yes, danger. We are ringing a bell. This is the meaning of crisis. But at the same time, the crisis will bring us out of our comfort zone. The crisis can help us give much more than we used to give. The crisis will frighten us, but the crisis might wake up a lot of positive things we have inside that we're not using. So yes, it is a danger. We are facing it. Let's accept it, and I will discuss it into details, but at the same time, let's dig for opportunities. I was in a meeting a couple of days with someone from an international community, and I've asked that woman, I said, sir, did we hit the Duatum in Lebanon? He told me, yes. I said, great, that's a good news, because if you have hit the bottom, we can start going up. He said, no, sir, you have hit the bottom, but you are starting digging. And this is true. This is true because we don't know where we are going. So after exactly dividing these this three words, this will help me and help you starting to discuss much more. I was discussing about the expatriate and about the Lebanese person. Again, when you meet any Lebanese anywhere in the world, so he will tell you, I left because my grand-grandfather left Lebanon looking for a better life. I left, my grandfather left 100 years. My father left 50 years looking for a better opportunity. I left during the war of the 40s, of the 50s, of the 60s, of the 80s. You will always find expatriates whom have left the country looking for better opportunity, who have left the country for exactly the same single reason we are facing today. 
decreasing of our average standard of living, decreasing of our security, frightening, looking for other opportunities. So this has been happening since hundreds of years. Let's accept it. Whoever you would meet, either they tell you, I left since a couple of years because I want to join the biggest hospital, doctor. I left because I want to be in engineering in the States. I couldn't find opportunities. So this has been going on since decades. But at the same time, you will find even he said, we have traveled the world, but we did not find the same quality of life. We did not find the warm of our friendship, of our families. We did not find our ground. So on one hand, you will have this anger. On one hand, you will have this fear. But on the same time, we are all so tied to our country. We are all so tied to our roots. Even if we have anger, even if we have fear, there is something that push us not only to stay, but specifically to face the crisis, to face what is going on, and sometimes it's out of our control. So, <clears throat> when we talk about any strategy, when we go into our, our any things, I want to go back to our classes of Math 201, is to draw a line, to draw a line in the space. You remember that when you want to draw a line in the space, and this can be learned to our small children, you need to put at least two points. One point, which is our starting point. The first point is where we are today. Where do we stand today with all the input and to be exactly clear and honest with yourself? Where we are today. And then you would say where we are going. Where we are going, and you will let me discuss about the second point at the end of my presentation. But why you need to put these two points? Because we need two points to draw a line. Otherwise, we'll be in the space going from infinity to infinity. So here is where we are. And this is how, where we are going. So this line is the plan. This line is your strategy. This plan is your vision. What would happen is that we'll have a lot of external factors in your hands, or mostly out of control, that will push, that will push you downwards. And this is exactly the crisis. I was preparing a job and I lost it. I was preparing an investment and it stopped. I cannot transfer my funds, and, and, and. So this will push you down here, so your plan can go down. But at the same time, we said crisis is a danger, and crisis in opportunity. And the opportunity are the forces that will push you upward. So in case we want just to draw something, our plan might go this way, but the end point will say the same. So this can oscillate the same way. If we want to go and to specifically say where we are today, and this is extremely personal, I want each one of you to say where we are today as persons. Where we are today as companies. Where we are today as institutions. Where we are today as economy. Where we are today as a country. Where we are today as a region. And honestly, if I put these four points I've just discussed, you would say and you will understand why we are all under stress. Because if I say where we are today as persons, each one of us is either working or looking for a job. If we're working and having been employed, we're really scared to lose our job. Because finally, I mean, the budget are being much lower. We're being paid less. The company have problems. So if you're employed, we are in a big test. And if you're not employed, you know that it will be extremely difficult to find a job. So as person, yes, we are under tension. As entrepreneurs or business owners, we feel exactly the same. We don't know if we're going to pay our fixed costs. We don't know if we're going to pay our variable costs. As person, we, we don't know if we can pay the dues of our children at school, at universities. So as person, yes, we are suffering. Yes, as person, it's very normal to have nightmares because we have so many question marks. So as person living here, we have multitude of questions and answered unanswered questions. So this is extremely normal that as persons, we have a lot of question marks. 
if we have to go and to go as company on the positive things, we are very proud that we have been exceptional company during these 30 years. We have built companies, university institutions that were defined and competing with the biggest multinational company in the world. We have, I mean, we, we had a public sector that was going backwards, backward and backward, but we had a private sector that was competing regionally, internationally, fantastic company that was built during the war and that was defined all the odds. But if we look at the companies from all sectors, we see that all our sectors are shaking. Let's not discuss about the financial sector that was the failure of our economy, the real estate, the industrial, the commercial. So even if we look at that, we will see that as company, as private sector, yes, we are in trouble. The SMEs that are the core of our economy, that are more than 86% of our economy, have very high debt ratio. We always discuss about the, the, the public debt. You have to know that the private debt has been being more than 50 billion, so it's equal to our GDP. So yes, we have very high debt ratio with companies that cannot survive as SME. We go back to the large company. In case you do have funds, you do understand that for these funds, either you have to keep it in reserve or you're thinking of how to export your knowledge and your success. And if you go into micro companies and start up, which is the core and we built and we have an innovation center here, yes, they are in trouble because there's no more funds, they cannot survive. So yes, even as companies, we have a big problem. If we go back and we discuss about our economy, and again, I'm still discussing where we are today. Is it a secret where our economy is here today? I'm sure that none of you and none of out of this room have always said that our economy cannot last. Why? Because we have, we, I said we because we are, each one of us is responsible and as well by myself. We have built a false economy. Let's go back 30 years ago. What was happening in the 89? We had kind of similar problem in the confidence level. If you recall, we had a problem. We wanted to rebuild the country. So we said, I mean, we have to attract investment. To attract investment, we get very high interest rate. We were giving interest rate of 30 or 40 percent on the Treasury bills in order to attract investment. Let's be realistic. How a country can pay 30 and 40 percent for rebuilding a country? I mean, to do that, you need a growth at least to 20 percent to cover it up. So we did it. We did it because we thought that we can rebring confidence. The country we were taken at that time are 500 million debts. And we were attracting cash from expatriates, from donors, from Arab countries, etc., to rebuild, which was good. But to rebuild confidence, you cannot give so high interest rates. So our economy was formed on a false economy. So what happened? We began to get debt. So we have increased the half a billion to $86 billion today, correct? Without building a country, without building a single infrastructure. And here, honestly, I want to say it very clearly, don't be, I mean, offended because we have to agree that even the reconciliation that happened in the 89 was a false one because we didn't have a real reconstruction, a reconciliation. What happened? We brought the heads of the world all over the country. We brought them. We, we said, I mean, you have destroyed the country for 17 years. Everything is destroyed. But what? We want to bring you back so you can reconstruct the country in 89. Is this possible? If you put it logically, whoever they are, of course it is impossible. So what happened? We had a war of 17 years that destroyed all the infrastructure, that destroyed all the country. And what happened? We thought, we, I said, we thought the country, the region, that we bring back the same people, the same leaders, we put them in power, we give them money, and we expect to build the country. What happened 30 years after? No infrastructure, no reconstruction, and the same people who have destroyed the country during 17 years have destroyed, but this time, economically, financially, and socially. Isn't it? So now, where we are today, can anyone expect, not of us, honestly, let's respect everyone. Do you think that the international community, who can know this much better than we do, 
We trust again the same people who were there for 17 years who destroyed the country physically and destroyed it again economically and socially in 30 years. Will be the same, will do the reconstructing of the real economy? Of course not. And these are facts. These are exactly facts, exactly what happened. So we have discussed about us as person. We have discussed about enterprise. We have discussed about the, uh, the, the country. Let's go back a little bit. On the region, on the region, let's go back and understand. We have around us four dramatic unsolved wars. We have a dramatic war in Syria. We have a war in Libya. We have a war in Yemen. We have a war in Iraq. Four dramatic wars unsolved around us. And we are a small country of five million persons. So we are in a big turmoil. We are in the middle of a volcano. So yes, we do have our problems, but at the same time, there are regional problems. I met two weeks ago the head of said conference, Pierre Dutin, in the foreign ministry, and he told me something, and I'm quoting him. He told me, you know, sir, there was a, coming of, a couple of years ago, we were scared that in case we have a downfall in Lebanon, the whole region will collapse. And I said, that's true. I was very happy. He said, no, sir, the whole region has collapsed without you. You are not anymore on our top priorities. We might help, but at the same time, you have to help yourself. And whenever I meet people, I'm always, and they ask me, but if the whole system that I've just described economically for 30 years, and again, I'm still describing where we are to see how we can move forward. So I was asked, so if our system was so bad, how did we, were, how were you able to survive during 30 years? How come that now we're collapsing? And this is the big question. We were on the verge of collapse several times. Several times, but again, because the region, because the international community didn't want them to collapse, they used to refinance our country to keep us the heart beating. So what happened again? We were, we have faced, I would say, not similar, but just before kind of financial security. And what happened? We had some friendship with the French and European, and we did Paris 1. We get $3 billion, $3 billion that were, most part of it went into corruption. And after Paris 1, we get some oxygen for a couple of years. We went back to the international community and said, we still have the problem. We need liquidity, which is the same problem we have today. But at that time, we need like 4, 5 billion. Now we need 30 on 40. So they did Paris 2. And what was doing this conference? It was financing the same economic wrong system. So we were just postponing the problem. So we had Paris 1, and then Paris 2, and then Paris 3. And when this changed, when this has changed, and again I'm going into facts, is when they have prepared a conference called CED. And CED in French means Conference des Reforms, Conference of the Reform with the Companies. And I can tell you, till the last moments, our leaders didn't understand what is said. On, during September, during a meeting with some ongoing ministers, I was asked, Dr. Intanjay is said, because said it's coming in a play to throw money. I said, but sir, said there is a conference that will finance real projects. Said there is a conference that will finance projects that will be audited internationally. Said there is a conference that will help Lebanon, that will help projects within faces with certain financing. And no one got the message. Everybody thought that as we had Paris 1 and 2 and 3, this would come again. So the international community have changed, the world has changed, but we have remained the same, which is impossible. You cannot resist change, even if you want to resist change. Even if you want to resist the collapse, we cannot because the world is changing. The leaders are changing. And I will name President Macron is not, is not President Chirac. President Trump is not Reagan. So it has changed, the demand has changed, but our leaders, our mindset has been exactly the same. So this is exactly where we stand today as persons, as economy, as uh, a country, and as region. You would say you are pessimistic. I will tell you I'm pessimistic, nor optimistic, I'm realistic. These are damn facts we are living through. But does this mean that it is the end? I will tell you, no. This means that we can even see it as a big challenge. We have to succeed where we have failed or where our parents and colleagues have failed. So this is, 
I would say, unfortunately, the point where we stand today with facts. I can even give more detail if you want during the Q&A, but these are the facts of the international community, the regional community, and internal. What happened 17th of October? Unrest, call it revolution, call it evolution. Are we with, are we against? Let's not say on 17th of October, we had and we witnessed a major change in Lebanon. Is it positive? I don't know. Is it negative? I don't know yet. But let's admit there is a Lebanon before the 17th of October. And there is a Lebanon after the 17th of October. Was it be positive? Will it be negative? We don't know yet. But first, let's admit and let's change our mind that we have a completely split between these two votes. And this, this date will remain in the minds. And again, I'm not taking any part of what's going on, but we have to admit. And why I'm saying that? Because now when I go into the subject of the crisis management in Lebanon, let's go back what happened with each one of us on the 18th of October. So this is it, after 30 years. <laughs> so, the first thing what happened on the 18th of October, everybody was happy, kind of. There was a change going on. We were, first of all, no one knew what's going on, but we were in a kind of night mode. Let's put it. We were on the TV, changing one, two, three, four. The kids were happy because they're losing a kind of days off. So the first days, we were like saying, okay, I mean, the change is acceptable. I mean, whatever. Are we with or against? We had our Lebanese flag and it's going. It was the, is it the music going on? So let, let's admit it. The first days were acceptable. Correct? Okay. And then it starts moving. We kept in the denial mode, say that tomorrow, after tomorrow, everybody, everything will come back to normal because we were dragged by our comfort zone. We wanted to stay the way we want, even if we were in a bad situation. We wanted to go back to the same life we had before the 17th. So we had in our dreams that everything will remain the same. Very few people knew to read between the lines that no, this is a very long pass that we're going to encounter. So the companies today, the sorting meeting as conflict management took some time. And again, we saw that this is going more and more complicated politically, socially, on the private sector, on the personal level. And till today, every single day is much more difficult than the other. I was asking someone, how are you today? He answered me much better than tomorrow. We're laughing, but this is the truth. So we started with a denial mode. We started to say, until today, we said, okay, I'm living a dream for someone and an nightmare for others. But most of the people we meet are in denial mode that we will go back to normal. No, we are not going back. To, we cannot go back to normal. We can go to worse. Is it, it's possible. Let's keep this in mind. And we can go to the complete restructuring. And again, we don't know. We will master what we have in hand. So... If we want to identify the two major problems we have, the two major problems, we have two new major problems. One is the trust and confidence that is completely lost. And this is extremely important. When anyone asks me, what do you think this crisis will last? How much do we last? I don't answer all the time. I say, yallah, well, I want to give some positive impact. But if I've asked you and I've asked myself, how much time we need to build trust and confidence we know that this takes years. Even if today I'm going back to the normal, today everything as is, holding other things equal, I know that just to rebuild trust and confidence, this will take years. So one first crisis, this is extremely important, trust and confidence into the financial system, into the country, and in everything that follows. Second issue that is quite difficult is the liquidity crisis we're living. Who could ever dream that will be waiting in the 21st century in line to get a couple of dollars. Who could ever imagine? So again, what happened? We started with a huge anger. Everyone. Why? Because again, denial, and then anger, and then problem. We quickly adapted. After a couple of weeks, we wrote al bank, we wrote to the 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 bank, 
وبنقول ثانك يو اند ذن ذا فيرست ويكس اوف ذا كرايسيس بنبلش نقول هيدا كان ازعل وهيدا عمل لي وهيدا شال لي بعدين بنقعد مع الشباب اللي هو انا اليوم سحبت 300 بص هديك بيقول له لا سحبت 200 وي ستارت كومبيتينج وي ستارت ادابتينج ما ذيس از كريزي هاو كان يو ادابت تو ذات اند ذن وانس وي ادابت تو ذات بيجينا ذا نيو ايشو ذات وي ويل بوت يو ليميتيشن اون كريدت كارد ويتش از نورمال واي بيكوز وي هاف ا هيوج بروبلم اوف ليكويديتي وي دونت هاف اني موني ان ذا كورسبوندينج بانك اني مور سو ايفريثينج اف يو بوت ذيس ان تو نمبرز This means that this will be worse and worse because we do have a liquidity problem. Yes, we do print Lebanese pound, which can lead and is leading to a huge depreciation of the pound, which is normal. But we don't print euros, we print in dollars. We won't have injection of funds. You tell me from where we'll have the injection of funds. Let's put it into numbers. We used to have 15% of our GDP, which is $7 million coming from the expat. Who is the crazy expat? Who will send a single dollar to his family anymore? Come on. No one for now, which is normal. Who is the crazy donor who will send again some money to finance what he has been financed for 30 years and now they knew where is the system? Come on, we are in a world of compliance mode. Every single transfer that is gone can be checked. Specifically to whom we call the PEP, politically exposed people. So yes, we will have and we have living a problem of liquidity that cannot be solved unless we have injection of funds. And the injection of funds can, can come from these two issues, international donors and expats. And for now, and the medium to the short run, this is blocked. Okay, we do have miracles, etc. But again, let's agree where we are. So... As we have doctors in here, and correct me if I'm wrong, when you have any disease, any problem, the first step is to accept the problem and to accept the disease to be able to start to cure it. If you deny it and you don't want to cure it, you can stay the same way the whole life. So the first thing to anyone that has any disease is to accept it in order to start building up. So the first thing into the Lebanese crisis management for each one of us is to accept that tomorrow is different than today. Is to accept that, yes, we are in a big downfall. We are in the collapse. You want to call it bankruptcy? Call it bankruptcy. You want to call it change? Call it whatever you want. But accept that we are in a big change. Why we have to accept it? Because once we accept it, we are able at least to put plan and to put strategies. Once you accept it, at least you decide and to see how to fight it. If you don't accept it, you will not fight it. If you don't accept it, you won't put any plan. You will be stick to your old strategy. You will be stick to your old plan, which is the, the worst thing you can do to crisis management. So the first thing and point one is accept. Accept the downfall. Accept that we lost a battle, but we did not lose the war. Once we accept it, we start putting the plan and the strategy and the draw the line to the point I will discuss afterwards. The first issue when we have crisis management, I said that it's planned and I said it might be strategy, but before that, before that, and I will just tell you a small, a small story that will explain my two points. I was invited to give a conference in the French Senate about the Lebanese successes. Imagine going to give about Lebanese in the French Senate. And why I was on the panel, and that's a very true story, I was just coming on panel before even the introduction. And I have this guy from the Congress, I mean, old guy, just putting his hand, yelling, yelling at me. He wanted the microphone. He wanted to speak before even introducing me. So I was on panel. So I did uh, Stress 101. You have to laugh. So I laughed, but I was tense because he was quite aggressive. And I knew that he wanted to attack me. I mean, I can read this in his face. And the moderator said, sir, Mr. Uh, uh, Congressman, you can talk after. I said, he wanted to, I said, okay, please give him the microphone. So I want him to cool, cool down, and I, at least I want to gain time. They gave him the microphone. He told me, you are Lebanese. So I understood by the message that he's going to attack me. So I told him, yes, sir, and proud to be. He continued. He said, you are the first masters of the CNC. So I started finding out what are the CNC. So I found the first one. I said, he will tell me corruption. I will tell you that you are corrupted as well. I was looking for the second C, and I told him, but sir, what are the two C's? 
He told me, you are the perfect masters of communication and connections. And he is right. He is right. We as Lebanese, we have in our genes the, con the connections issue. We are, we are the best communicator. If you go and you take a taxi from the airport, and you have this French guy that goes on, and you have the Lebanese taxi who said hey, bonjour and merci. He can have a conversation with the guy to the north or the south in France with merci and thank you. And same in English. We are communicators. We have this in our genes. We have connection. Wherever you travel the world, you will find families and friends or neighbors anywhere. So we have this connection that we are not losing. So number one in crisis management, and this is the core of any crisis, is communication. Before even starting the plan is to communicate. And this is the first mistake that wasn't done by many sectors in Lebanon. One is communication. Communication with your family, with your group. Communication with your company. Communication with your managers. Communication with your clients. Communication with your suppliers. Communication with your suppliers locally. Internationally, don't forget internationally to communicate, to tell them I'm not being able to transfer the money because at the first time, who can understand this? I'm not able to, uh, come on, I'm not able to transfer. And then after digging, they understood that yes, it's true. So number one is true communication. And this is how crisis management stops. Through communication with your team. Communicate what's happening. Communicate exactly the truth. What I just said that is negative. Yes, communicate. Second issue, I would say connection. Why? Because we will need new allies. We will need new partners. We will need new support. We will need new friends. We will need maybe new employees. We will need to, to, to build strategic alliances. We will need to build new collaboration. We will need to build new synergies. So this is how crisis management starts. Number three, and this you will be amazed. What you need to communicate and to do connections, you need transparency and honesty. If you want really to drag people to fight with you, be honest with them. Tell them the truth. Tell them, yes, we are bankrupt. Tell them, this is my file. This is what I'm going to do. This is what I know and this is what I don't know. Accept. Don't say, I know everything. Nobody knows. I just told you. Why do I don't have a PowerPoint? Because I cannot laugh at myself. I cannot laugh at you to put you a PowerPoint. We are in a situation that is changing every single minute. Be honest. Trust. To get trust, you be trusted. So yes, you need transparency. You need to be very clear. And this is how you will build your crisis management team. By communicating, by doing the new connections. And here you buy to sign your crisis management team. You will build your emergency room. We need emergency room in our houses, yes, to start to give even the input to our kids. We need emergency room in our buildings so we don't have new robberies. We need emergency rooms in our businesses to face the prices. We need emergency room in our university. We need new emergency room to start to say this is the crisis management team. Once we do that, we'll go to say, yes, we need new process. Don't stay with your old process because we just admitted that everything has changed. So yes, we need new process. We need crisis management process. No one will tell you which one is right or wrong. But you need a process and a process that will be followed. A process that will be respected. A process where we will have new champions, new leaders. A process where everyone is a resource. If I go back to the idea of communication, we are in a war. If I want just to put an idea on communication and move forward. You remember when I'm going to the world war, the war of the, uh, 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 the Iraqi war. You remember during that war, I will never forget, we had every single week the General Schwarzkopf that was saying exactly, we are going to fight, we are going to take Baghdad. We are, you had a full information that was going on every single week because this was the communication of the war. And then you had the Iraqi, Iraqi side, if you, 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 the Safah, Hamad Safah. And honestly, this was great because I was looking for his name yesterday night while preparing. So I went into Google and I found some videos. They were saying, no, we have hit four Apaches. 
We have prisoners, but during the Geneva conference, we cannot show the prisoners. So it was a war of communication. And the war has ended with communication with not even one wounded. So the biggest war in the world are communication wars. So we said, yes, communication. Yes, we said connection. We agreed that we will go transparency. We will have a process with an emergency room, with new infrastructure, and specifically, what is extremely important? We said we need a structure. We need to pass a structure. But what is extremely important is the decision-making process. We know that usually in many medium to large organizations, decision-making sometimes goes through bureaucracy. Take some time. Why? It takes some time because you have to go to several stages, several departments, through a certain process. Now that we're in crisis management, rule number one is to burn the light and go to the decision. You cannot postpone decisions because the crisis is going much bigger than you think. You have to take the decisions. And here, don't fear the good and the bad decisions. There is no good and bad, but there is decision and no decisions. Once you do the decision, you follow it up. So decision-making process is a completely new, different process during the crisis. You are, you have to decide, I'll go left or right. You don't know which is better, but you're going to go in the middle, you'll hit the wall. So, we are not, this is a crisis management. This is it. We are, fully agree. So, we said that we will have crisis management group that should be every single day, every week, depending on what we're doing. We agree that we'll build a structure and very important, let's agree, but you, because you said it, thank you very much. If you don't know what to do, why? Because we will follow something that is dramatic, but we have to, is trial and error. Because we don't know. Again, we have a lot of question marks. So to do trial and error, we need to meet and to say and to share experience. So on one hand, I would advise to have crisis management meetings, but on the same time, you have to make sharing of experience meetings. Why? Because your teams will go on the ground and they will come back to share experience. Said, I said that. I tried that. This worked and this didn't work. I said this to this customer. He accepted. I said this to this, to this supplier. He did not accept. So while sharing experience, while getting information, at least you are putting new database into the crisis management mode. So you will have this crisis management team, but at the same time, you have to have this sharing of experience team that can be the same, but in different meetings. In one meeting, we put the guidelines, the process, and we follow, and we have to be extremely strict. No game. Like in the army, you have to follow. You are the commander, or you accept your commander, and at the same time, you need to have meetings where you share experience and celebrate success because you will have some small successes. You need to give vitamins to your team. You need vitamins. So at the same time, celebrate Small successes, small milestone to give back, I would say, and to motivate again and again. You need to gather information. Everyone in your organization, in your surrounding, is a source of resource. The biggest war in the world are managed by intelligence. Intelligence means every single person in your organization should be a source of information, should be a source of opportunity, should be a source of idea. Good people, you are the magnet. Be the positive one and people will reflect you. Be a negative one and people will follow exactly the same way. So yes, gather information more and more. Once you gather information, you will put the process and it will help you into decision making. Don't fear decisions. We are not in a normal zone. And again, accept and say, when we say back to the communication, say, I'm taking that decision. I don't know if it's good or bad. Let's be all convinced it's good and to follow it up. This is how you can start facing the crisis. You need training, we need coaching, and you need new team building. And here, a small example, most of you and us have lived the world, have lived the world. We used to fight with our neighbors for a parking spot. We used to fight for our neighbors for a horse. And we stay months and years without talking to them. When we started to bring back the, the, the ties, when we were going all together in the shelters, 
when we went in the shelters, we have rebuilt connections. We have put aside all our differences because we wanted to protect ourselves. This means we are today in a different social economic shelter. It is time to put aside any significant conflict we had before. Is it in your families? Is it in your enterprise? Is it with your friends? To build the real ties because we need the real allies. Everybody. So again, as we solved all the problems in the shelters and we founded new families, let's form new families today to face this new social and economic crisis. This is where, this is an opportunity. During the crisis, you know something? You will find a lot of fake friends. You will find a lot of fake allies. But you will find new partners. You will find new family members. It is the opportunity to bring back down the mask and find who is really who. Who's who, the biggest book. We have to make scenarios. When you say scenarios, and this is something extremely important. You know what is financially? Let's go a little bit into the financial thing. The worst thing a company can do today, and please don't be offended if you did that, but just to tell you, is to take your previous balance sheet, income statement of previous year, and you say, okay, I will do expectation based on that for the new one. That is the worst you can do. Why? Because this is exactly defying what we said, the denial mode. We said that we have a company before the 17, we have a company after the 17. You have to put a, bla a blank board in front of you and start from scratch. In your cost, in your variable, in your fixed cost, in your sales, in your number of students, we have to start from scratch. Yes, use information that you had, use experience, but bring a white paper in front of you to design any new expectation because all the data, all the variables have changed, are changing, or will change. So start from scratch, redesigning the whole. When you say redesigning, this is time to restructure. So don't put your previous numbers and come with a red and say, I will discuss this and this and this. Say, no, I start from scratch and I'll go back to the fixed cost, to the variables, to the financials, and so and so forth. So make contingency plans. Risk management. This is risk management. You said, to, if I draw, if I go back to this kind of numbers, what is my new break-even break analysis? What should I do? Be careful. Not what should I do to get profits. Not what should I do to grow. What should I have numbers to survive the crisis? What should I sell to stay on my feet for 12 months, for 14, for 36? So the new numbers and expectations you're working on into the crisis management is on the survival and not specifically on the growth. Keep the growth in mind, but say number one, it's survival mode. I want my heart to stay beating. I want to stay on my feet. I want to be the next person on entrepreneurs and company that will be here. I want to remain alive. <coughs> Two more points. So we agreed on the, con on the connection, communication, everything. And what is one of the core issues into crisis management? Negotiation. The whole thing will be negotiation. Negotiation with who? Again, we will negotiate internally. Because we have to convince, you have to be convinced in order to get convictions of your team. You will need negotiation with your teams. You will need negotiation with your clients. You will need negotiation with your supplier, internal supplier. You will need negotiation with the international supplier. How you will go and negotiate with the internal supplier? Say, I'm really sorry, I still want to get your material, but I cannot pay you because we have a quality, a capital control. So if the the supplier will Google and say, no, sir, we have no political control. You have no law for that. Say, no, but in Lebanon, we don't need those. We can do it. Imagine how good you should be to negotiate with your international supplier. And the suppliers will believe you because you have a history. They will believe you because you have a track record. So, yes, negotiation, renegotiation, a different way. We used to negotiate to bargain on prices. We need to negotiate to get the best deal. Now we are negotiating to stay alive. We are in negotiation to keep our space, to keep our space here and space specifically to be the first people or the first company 
who will be ready when we will go out of the crisis because we will go out of the crisis. There is not a single crisis in the world that has left. Not. But, but, we have to be and to be ready. I say that this is marvelous in Lebanon that we have created a, a great private sector. We have created great people. I said, and I will, we as per reputation, and I said, we are very proud to have the best entrepreneurs in the world. So this is the positive side. But the negative issue, and let's admit it and focus on that, we are the most individualistic person we have in the world. We have built 60 banks in Lebanon. We have built 70 universities. We have built how many hospitals, how many cinemas, how many industries. We have built everything. We have 5 million persons in Lebanon. We need to have 5 million companies. This was the expectation. Can we survive this way? Is this model possible? Of course not. This model will last? Of course not. This means we have to prepare ourselves to build M&A, merger and acquisitions. This is time for it. If you're not ready yet, we acquire. Go ring the bells, go ring the doors, not the doors, and say, I want to make a strategic alliances. We need to merge. We need acquisition to face the crisis because it is impossible, impossible that the same companies, the same hospital, the same university will be there in 10 years. Who will stay? Those who have the structure, who are the core, or who have built the reality, those will stay. And let's acquire others. It's time for it. Acquisition and M&A is crucial into any crisis management. My last point just on companies, and then I, I will take five minutes and then q and is it fine with you? All right. And the last thing, I said that large companies are facing problems. We went into SMEs, but we have a crucial opportunity into the micro companies. What is sure, what is 100% sure, is that the new economy won't be to the old large companies, but, and this is known by history, it will be for these new micro companies, micro companies that are the engine of any restructuring. So put your radars and look at these geniuses. We have to look at these small companies and invest in. Diversify your risk. And I always said that to anyone who has money in the bank, say, how can I bring back my money? Say, don't bring back your money. Invest into entrepreneurs. Invest into small companies because they're the future. At least if they succeed, they will get you the money outside Lebanon. At least in case they do any success, they will be able to be resold in outside the boundaries. Invest into micro companies. Invest into startups. Go into funds. Diversify your financial risk. Don't think that you will live anymore on any interest rates. We all fell into the, pra the trap. Let's learn from it. Let's accept it. We all fell. On different level, but we all fell. I just would like to put two strategies that can work. It's the 3D strategy. The 3D strategy will tell you that always think into development. Development, even in terms of crisis, we said that the opportunity will bring you out of your comfort zone and the development phase will help you find all the single bad things you did. So learn from the past experience and okay, this is what I did right. And this is my point of strength. I will work on new point of strength again in order to develop, not here, but in the coming future. The biggest development is not the development that you do in the present. The best development you do is a development that you plan during the crisis so you're ready once you'll have the growth. So the development is prepared now because everybody will be, I would say, uh, uh, is in new resources. You will be finding new leaders and you will be assigning new champions. Look at the new champions. Anyone in the company can be a new leader and you will see, just put open your head and your eyes and you will find many leaders and many champions that were just Hiding before. Why? A lot of things. So, yes, development. Two, one thing is sure, those who are surviving today are those who diversified. Who diversified their product, their markets, their people, diversification, their markets. So, if in case you did it, focus on it, invest more time. In case you did not, diversify. You cannot work more than two. Diversification. 
And all the companies in the world, I will never forget that story. I was traveling and I had someone that came. I mean, I was sitting in, in a plane with someone and I told him, I don't like to talk in the plane, but I told the guy, what do you do? He told me I'm the CEO of Olympus. I said, wow, great. I love Olympus. He told me, what do you know about Olympus? I said, you're the camera guy because the first camera I received from my parents was an Olympus camera. He looked at me and he turned his head. He didn't talk to me. All the plane. I said, what did I say? Come on. I just said I like Olympus. And then before the landing, I said, excuse me, sir, but Olympus, you're not in the cameras? He said, sir, we saw cameras many years ago. We are the number one into medical equipment in the world. So this means I've completely shifted. So many companies in the world started somewhere and went it down for and shifted. So is it time today to shift? Of course it is. Diversify. And number three, the delegate. Delegate to these new leaders. Delegate to your new champion. Identify those people who are hiding or you were putting on the side. Identify the new, the new leaders of the crisis. Most of the time are not the same leaders before the crisis. Why? Because you have a lot of leaders that during the crisis are not ready nor willing to face the crisis. And during the war, you have a lot of new courageous women and men that are ready and willing to take the fight and take the challenge. Find them. In this same university, I have learned the four P's. You remember the four P's, the product, the life, promotion, and the place. But life has taught me my new four P's. My students that took my course will know them, but I will put it together. Number one, and this is perfectly adaptable to the crisis management, the first P is perception. How you perceive the things and how you are perceived. How you perceive the crisis, you perceive it as a collapse or you perceive as a challenge. How you will be perceived by the world. Perception is extremely important. The second P, where you will need into this new fighting, is the passion. When you have passion, you will love with all your heart. You will work 24 hours. You will never count. You will give everything you have. You will work all your personal force because with passion, you need a lot of passion and love to your family and home to face such a difficult crisis. The third P, anyone can help me, is patience. We will need patience. I just told you that we have a crisis of confidence. We have a crisis of trust. We have a crisis of liquidity. This cannot be solved in a couple of days, unfortunately. It will, lay, it will take time. So we need a lot of patience, but trust and confidence in our head. And finally, if I had to use one P, thank you for somebody who said it, it's perseverance. It's not the strongest of the, cheese, the species that will survive, but it will be the most responsible to change. So perseverance, it's, we cannot abandon the ship. We cannot let the ship go down. This is impossible. So I come to my end point, and it's true that I've drawn one single point. Why? Because I said what we discussed here, the points, and I've drawn one point. To be honest with you, I will put two points. Why? Because this is the realistic one that I will just and I name during my presentation. And this is our objective. And we might have two lines. This point is the point that is based on all the data that we discuss where we are. Yes, and we have to know and we have to admit. Yes, we have a risk of collapse. Yes, we have a risk of downfall. Yes, we have a risk of bankruptcy, admitted and accepted. Yes, we have a risk of growing the poverty rate more than 50% as after the World Bank. Yes, we have a risk of war. Yes, we have a risk of completely of losing everything with it. Yes, we have to know this risk. And this is here and we have to always keep this in mind, not to fear it, but to face it. And here is where you want to be, where we all want to be. And I will tell you something, and believe me, I have this in my heart. We have the best and crucial opportunity we have missed all over the 30 years. In case we didn't have this opportunity and what happened today and the biggest chances, we would be still living into the same wrong economy, persons, company that we were since 89. We have failed the reconciliation. We had had a bad reconciliation. And to be honest, I will tell you what I have in the middle of my heart. What I have in the middle of my heart is, yes, anger, 
Yes, I have fear. Yes, I have denial. But I tell you something, I have a lot of trust and confidence. And you know when I regain, I regain my trust? I regain my trust when I saw the youth and when I saw the women going on the street with one single flag, the Lebanese flag that I have dreamed all my life. I regain my confidence when I saw women and children from all the ages holding hands from north and south, say, we want change. I regain confidence when I, see, I saw women facing people with arms, saying, we want change, and this is the real revolution for every Lebanon. I regain confidence when I saw the real reconciliation going on on the street that we have missed 30 years ago. I regain trust when I saw people from north and south saying names and putting slogans that were completely taboos. I regained confidence when I saw army with tears in their eyes, saying, we want as well change, we are following orders. I regained confidence and I regained trust when I saw women and fathers going on the street saying, we don't want our children to travel again. I regained confidence and trust when I saw people all over the world in front of the embassy saying that, we have left the country for the same reason that have dragged billions of people on the street. And we are with you because we left, because we couldn't change. But now we have the chance and now we have the opportunity to change. I regain trust and I regain confidence when I knew that my people, my even people that I saw that were sleeping and accepting everything, woke up and told to the world, we want change, we want to fight for the change, we want to fight for the challenge. I gain again trust when I knew and I read in each one of your eyes that you will not surrender and that you will fight for the change of our economy, of our system, of our mindset, of our company, because that's our country, we will not leave it up to anyone. Thank you. Damon, Q&A, <laughs> comments, questions, attack. <laughs> Come on. So I ask the questions. Doctor, can we have a microphone? Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. This was uh, truly inspiring. After a talk like this, it's difficult uh, to, uh, to know where to start. But um, where do you think our biggest challenges at this stage in, in trying to get reforms? And I'll give you my, my take on this, uh, if you may. I think our biggest challenge now is winning uh, the next round of elections. Because the people are still divided in the country, and there's still a significant portion of Lebanese who, for many reasons, still support the old guards. How uh, can we affect change in those people? And how can we guarantee that at least the revolution will win the biggest uh, 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 number of parliamentaries in the next round of elections? Uh, thank you very much for the question. Uh, you know, uh, we have two, two kind of changes that should occur. We have now a, a, a crucial change because we have a new executive team. Again, let's disregard about any politics or something. We have a new executive team. Everything that I just talked about, the process management, which is decision making, uh, adaptive, uh, adaptability, and everything, should occur now. And which is extremely important, we have a very important test first to this ruling team, which is a quick decision making with a full plan. And this is the major part I want each one of you to understand. We've been going into the news, even if you did not ask me the question, about, about the Eurobonds. If we pay the Eurobonds, we don't pay the Eurobonds. They stop me on the street, say, what do you think? We have to pay the Eurobonds, or we should... As if this is a question. It is not a question. You have a debt, you have to pay it. Okay? However, the big question is that if you decide to pay it or to negotiate, would be part of a full plan. So the question is not if I pay the euro bond or I decide not, but the question is how do I do a complete full plan and I start implementing it. So the first change would be, again, to the executive first, exactly up before the legislature, to go say, okay, we are now in power. We have to take quick decision and go into the communication, say a very clear plan. 
So the reforms that should be done are exactly the same reforms we've been discussing since 20 years, since Paris 1 and 2 and 3. People ask about reform. We don't need, we don't need reform. We don't even need the IMF to come and to tell us what to do because it's, there have been years saying that. If you just take the reforms that were promised in Paris 1, 2 and 3 and, and see there's, and you start putting them in place are the expected reforms. So number one, if I go back and to say, if we have a chance politi uh, politically, in the executive power is to have a clear plan that has to be disclosed. One, to say to the people, okay, that's where we are. That's exactly what we want to do. A completely plan. And within the plan, you say, okay, I can pay half of my euro bonds. I can pay 20%. I can bring these, uh, uh, this debt person at least to renegotiate. This is the question. The question is not if I pay or not, because this is a due. Two, you ask me about any election or something. This, if it happens, will take time. And I hope, I hope at any time that we will have specifically election, although I'm not sure that we'll have a lot of changes. We're just discussing it together before. But yes, I think that this is extremely important, at least to bring back the confidence of the people and to say, in case we change 10, 20, 15, 30% of any parliament, this would be any start. But again, we know that this is a process. Let's say that you go into elections and you are just able to say, I changed 10% or 15. Again, this is, will be a very long way on. So, yes, I have confidence, but this is the track. Once we, knew, we need to have an executive power that is taking decisions, right or wrong again, but take decisions. And I was saying after the first meeting, and honestly, I'm disclosing information. I met the prime minister and I told him, please take decisions. Disclose your plan. Don't tell me what's your plan. Just put the plan and say, that's what I'm going to do. Take decisions. It is not normal to stay three meetings to discuss what you're going to do to your bonds. Say 24 hours. Go on a retreat if you need more time. I'm not saying that you have to solve it in a couple of hours. But you go in, you say, when we go out, we'll go out with a decision. And this is crisis management. It's not business as usual. You meet every single day if needed. You need 24 hours. You go on a retreat. And then, again, we go decision-making process and speed of adaptation. So... If we have this, we will be on the right track. If we don't, it will take more time, but it will keep my, uh, my, my trust and confidence. Again, did I answer your question? Yes. I missed one of it. <laughs> we might. Hi, Elisa Hajj. Actually, I'm a communications expert, and I'm, I've been asking the government, the new prime minister, I mean, many leaders in the country to communicate more openly with people, because I think this is the problem. But we are an individualistic society, as you said, and uh, they consider communication, it definitely is not on the priority list. And uh, uh, I think the... Uh, Everything that we're facing, mainly because of lack of transparency and talking to people ethically and telling them what's happening and uh, what, how do you recommend we go about it? If we're active on the streets, we want things to change uh, 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 peacefully, definitely. Not, we don't want uh, this to happen by force, but how, how do we go about it? How do we pressure on making them uh, being transparent? And Because if they're transparent now, they'll be transparent whenever they, there are projects, we can... Uh, um, um, have them more credible about what they plan to do. Okay, uh, thank you again for this, uh, for this question, and I will emphasize more on that. When we say we need clear communication and transparency, again, when you want to convince somebody to do it, it's not because we want to communicate without like communication, nor that because we're transparent. Because if we don't communicate correctly, what will happen? You will have the war of rumors. What's happening today on just a WhatsApp that you send today? And on a WhatsApp, you go into several groups, you can spread any single rumors, and that's what's going on. You have a lot of false information going on. So the question is, what do you want? You want to keep it the false information going? You want to keep the internal and external enemies destroying our country, or you want to communicate correctly? And this is my question, not only to the ministry. I would say that exactly the central bank. With you know, I mean, for those who know, I'm quite close to the to the governor as a person, and I told him. You want to face the crisis, you have to go every single Monday, going into the press conference, give your number, say exactly where we are, what is your plan, where are you going, and even if the information are wrong, even if we have negative issue, you have to face the people. And again, I know that we have bankers in the room. The biggest problem that the bank did 
It's not the question of $100 or $200 whatever. You have to know and we have to admit that person of line that they don't have the liquidity. The biggest problem they did is the communication. Till today, we don't know what will happen on Monday. Till today, we don't know what's happening with our limits. You cannot face the crisis this way. At least admit, say, okay, I am obliged to do that. I cannot give you cash anymore in a couple of weeks, but I will work to get it for you. And again, this is communication. Let's go back to what happened to the prices. When we went to the manager and so, how did we accept what's going on? When we had somebody that came in that convinced us and told us what's going on. We were under tension when we didn't know. When the banks opened and said, okay, there is no money in and everybody went. So again, if you go logically, you might understand. But again, to face the anger, you have to communicate transparently, at least to get back part of the confidence, part of the confidence that you have lost. So again, the idea is not a conviction. Either you do that or you face all the false information going on. So it's a choice. Who would ever take the, the negative one? Yes, sir. Hi. Okay, so in the 3D strategy that you talked about, uh, development, diversify, and delegate. Uh, one of the things that we were talking about is diversify into new markets or etc. Why don't you believe it's a good, or do you believe actually, is this a good, I come from an F&B industry, I'm one of the owners of a local pastry shop in Lebanon. Okay, uh, over 780 businesses closed since October till, till now, and that's the reports that just came out this week actually. Do you believe, uh, that's my question, do you believe is it a good time to open a new branch or a new business in Lebanon with the current situation? What's your name? Marwan. Marwan. I have smushkis, by the way. <laughs> okay, great. Uh, ah, there you go. <laughs> Marwan, uh, diversification, but this is, I thank you for, for highlighting that. You know, diversification doesn't mean do today a new investment. Diversification needs preparation. Diversification, because you are out of your comfort zone, you can be much more creative and innovative. You can prepare things. The best diversification are the things that you have prepared when you are not ready for it. The best ideas would come when you are out of your comfort zone. The best ideas. So once you put this idea, this doesn't mean that you can start it tomorrow. But this means that you are preparing yourself, at least putting a new strategy. By this diversification, please test it you will be bringing back a lot of your innovation, a lot of your creativity. You will bring your people to think that we have the prices, but we're going to go out of it. And when I go out of it, that's what I do. I will tell you something, and this is very different, but it's exactly I'm having somebody in prison. When you have in prison, if that guy starts dreaming the day he will go, what he will really do, and you have people saying, whatever I do, when I go back, I'm going to fight again to be in the prison. So that's, we are in the prison today, let's admit it. But we are dreaming on the single moment when we will go out, what we're going to do. So this is how you will start. It. You prepare it. You make your feasibility. You make your pilot study. You make your example, whatever you do. You prepare and you keep it in your fridge. And you will choose the best moment to bring it out. This is diversification. Diversification is not going chaotically and do new investment because we are in a problem. By diversification means because you're out of the comfort zone. We have to be extremely creative and innovative, and this will bring, and again, you will find a lot of leaders that you never even ask about their ideas, but now during this crisis management meeting, you have people that, that will come to tell you, you know, sir, I think we should do this. I think that when it is over, again, when we say when it's over, this is the positive things you will have as a person, and that will uh, spread all over. We have to be creative. Or again, let's learn one single thing on our leaders. Honestly, if I learned something from this crisis, I learned that we have the most innovative and creative leaders in the world. They have defying even Hamilton and Washington who created the dollars. In case these people can go up of the thumb, they will kill themselves. Imagine that these leaders have created three dollars that never have in the States. You have the dollar that you have in the bank, that's A. You have the dollars that you have in the pocket, that's B. You have the dollar that you would bring, that you called fresh money. <laughs> fresh money. fresh money. And you have the dollars that you have outside the boundaries. You have four dollars. Imagine how creative they are. We have leaders. They are so creative. Let's be creative the same way, but in your pastry. And I'm sure this would be much better. <laughs> okay, thank you. Yes, ma'am. Hello, Zena.
So you know, you know something. This is related to the major problem that I said when I started: the confidence problem. The confidence problem that you will have again, specifically outside the boundaries, because now when you go to negotiate, because it's not about negotiation with your international supplier, the country have lost the complete, the complete trust. Okay. So this will take a lot of time. But you know something? We had as Lebanon a bad reputation, but one thing: as people, I think that. We have a very good reputation that is maintained. When you go in any in any county co company in the world, any hospital, anything, you will find that the best doctors, the best entrepreneurs, the best managers are Lebanese. This is automatically. So again, we are going into university. No, I would say between private and public. I think that it will take it will take us some time, as he was saying, to rebuild exactly the executive, the legislative. But as a private sector, it is time to show our resilience. It is time, again, to prove to the world that, indeed, we are the most resilient business people, students ever in the world. And we have earned this reputation. So, again, we have to fight for it. And this is extremely true. You know something, What and when I discussed it in the Senate about the, I mean, the, 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 the point of strength of the Lebanese entrepreneurs, the biggest point of strength that we have is the speed of adaptation. Not adaptation, the speed of adaptation. And again, see in which speed we have adapted to this damn crisis, which is wrong. We have, we should not accept. But the speed of adaptation will keep us surviving. So again, yes, we have not to change, to keep our reputation because we do have an excellent reputation. And again, we have to fight together to change the reputation of our country, which is known. And again, the reputation of Lebanon, as I said, is yes, the nightlife and the wars and the crisis. So this is the two reputation, unfortunately, that we have. So let's admit it the way it is to rebuild it. So one, we have to maintain it. And two, we have to change it in the medium and in the long term. Yes? Nade, uh, I will tell you something. Okay, let's divide it again. Okay. Okay, let's divide it. Again, I have to divide it private and public. Into the private, I can assure you, and you are in a big institution, that you know that you, and I'm sure you did, you did a crisis uh, uh, a process, you did, you did your communication. So on a private level, and I know that Abid did the same in the Arab Bank. You did that. You 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 did that automatically. This is why you have company today surviving the crisis, the breakthrough. As government, as government, again, what we're doing, we are teaching, we are coaching. But till this minute, this didn't happen. So we'll keep fighting for that. The day we will see a new communication going on, transparency from the leader, at least transparency, accepting what's going on, we will be on the verge of the changing. If doesn't this doesn't happen, this doesn't mean that the collapse is going more and more. This means it will take much more time. So again, if you ask me, and I change your question, when are we going out of the mess? I will tell you at least, let's start with the plan. Till this minute, there is no plan. Till this minute, there is no plan. The day we'll have a clear plan, we'll say, okay, from this moment, we might need five years. But this will start once you have the full plan. Why is that not? This is a big history and we have discussed it once we have this. Yes, Abdallah. Yes, ma'am. Please do. أول واحدة تبع إذا في potential new businesses بلبنان بهيدا الوضع. Second, the communication. Third, the change. هبدا كونفرنس حاله. So uh, yeah. <laughs> I work as a marketing manager and project leader at InnoVest. What we do is we uh, incubate, we help startups expand the region, the uh, MENA region. So, hello, uh, Fitna, we just launched uh, a new startup. Yeah, it solves the problem of the scam in Lebanon. So, if we look, I mean, I'm very in the country where there is a lot of crisis, like Lebanon, there are more opportunities than in the country further developed. Uh, this, this is one, so I that will be potential. Uh, two, concerning the communication part, uh, I believe that we should educate people about media literacy, about fake news. This is the best thing we can do. 
so they can differentiate between the true and the false news. A third for the change, I believe it's not going to happen overnight, but at least we're setting the bench for the coming 15 and 20 years. So أكيد ما منحلم بكرة حيتغير كل لبنان. هيدا الشيء اللي تسروتد هالكوربشن من أكبر حدا لأصغر حدا كتير بده وقت تنغيره. وهيدول العالم بدهن وقت يعني they will pass away eventually. It's not a bad thing. It's a fact. So then من غير. These are comments and I fully agree. <laughs> yes, yes. Hi, uh, Rawan Saab. I have a question that you talked a lot about uh, shifting uh, your business model, for example, if you're in a current crisis. Um, but of course, with this decision making and shifting business model comes uh, certain investment fees or uh, financial expenses that you have to pay. And not from the now, we need to hala. So it's. So my follow-up question would be, we know it's like we have a crisis management team, we have a lot of ideas, uh, so we know what to do, but we're not sure how to implement or how much we should risk the financial part of it. Uh, Rawan, thank you very much for the question. Uh, shifting, just to make it clear, shifting doesn't mean to have any new investment. It can be. Okay, I agree. I, 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 I got your message. Sometimes it does. But a lot of times shifting, this is with the internal people and the internal resource you have. So again, the first thing is to start this completely change of model with the existing people you have. These are the best, I would say, the best advisor you can ever hire. No advisor can help you change unless you have your internal advisor. So I'm not at all discussing about new investment. It might be, it might, this is a possibility. But what I wanted when I said to change the structure and the model is with your existing people. And I said, you have to highlight the new leaders. You will have the new champions. And most of the time, the old leaders that used to, to be there will be those who won't be the next leaders and the new champions. So cha you, you need to identify within your company the new champions within this new uh, process or what we have called crisis management the structure. And this is need a very clear structure. So I, I did not talk about a new investment, although it can be, it can depending. You might have a lot of funds in the bank that you need to reinvest again. So it, it depends exactly your status. Yes. You are moderating. Uh, good evening. Hello. Uh, my name is Muhammad Jawad. Uh, so I, you mentioned something about startups and the fact that they're the future, which uh, makes perfect sense. Uh, of course, you know about Circular 331, which supports the startup ecosystem. So uh, there's been a lot of talk about the central bank. Uh, Abandoning this project, there's there's a lot of funds that can't seem to get their money. Uh, do you have any uh, news or uh, idea of what's going on? Or is the startup ecosystem going to be abandoned? And basically, what's going to happen to 331? Okay, that's Muhammad, a very good question. And I will give you very fresh news. So we have fresh dollars. I give you fresh news from the governor that I met that I met yesterday. Um, uh, he, so the bad news is that most of the funds of the 331 have been used, have been used and unfortunately have been dispersed completely. Second issue that you know that the funds of the 331 circular are coming from the banks, are coming from the banks as a percentage of their assets. Uh, so let's not comment on that. So this would be extremely difficult, even if they still have funds to go again to fund the 331. But I can assure you that the, the central bank and the teams that have worked were already preparing the second stage of the acceleration process within the trip one. But this can only be financed specifically by new injection of funds that might be, and this is the, the good thing that I'm telling you, from international donors like the, uh, the uh, Central Bank of Europe who is extremely keen on that, something called the AFD, Agence Francophone de Développement, and Proparco, which is coming from the French government, that are preparing funds for that because they all knew that in order to restructure the economy, you have to change it to the ecosystem. But we go back to one of my piece, which is patience. It's impossible during this turmoil or today to expect that. But we will have, and this is 100% complete, and it's part even of the said conference and all the conferences that have been prepared for Lebanon. The Brussels conference, the Rome conference, the London conference, all this conference, you had funds assigned for the ecosystem. So this is the good news, but it is not for tomorrow because there are some changes specifically in the chaotic issue and, uh, and environment we're facing. So with the lack of trust and the uh, monetary fund, uh, just keeping an eye on the political situation, it's not going to happen in the next 
year. I, I will not put, honestly, I will not put specific yeah. moment. It can, again, and in my meetings with the donors, with the, uh, I mean, the, 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 the country supporting said, and my, my message was that, yes, we have a big problem in Lebanon. Don't abandon the private sector. Don't abandon the youth. Don't abandon the companies. And I told, I told them why. I said, because if you abandon, you will have a lot of bankruptcy and collapse, and you will keep the bad ones. You will, we will keep those who are doing money laundering. We will keep those who are doing a lot of corruption. In case you believe in our system and you want to change the political one, at least fund the existing company. So this is the lobby we're doing. But again, this will need some structure and time. I cannot tell you months or years. I have to be extremely, uh, I would say, cautious and meticulous on that. But in our lobby side, as business people, we're working a lot on that because we believe that this is the future and this would be the major engine of any coming growth, I hope, in the near future. Thank you. Thank you, Hamad. Uh, okay, I do have some, uh, just one message before I leave. Uh, I did not welcoming him because I really wanted to keep the best to the end, but I want to welcome our fathers to all of us, one of the biggest fathers of our university, and a very dear friend and mentor of mine, Dr. Jabra. I want, I want to honor him for several issues. One of the biggest mistakes he did, and he did, we all do mistakes, is that he invited me to join the Board of Trustees of the University. I'm very honored to be in this board, but if I am on the board, it's because we had this president that was here all over. And I can tell you that during these boards, he managed perfectly well all the university, and he's already been missed a lot. Dr. Jabra, I wanted to get you a small gift, and I, looking at that, I didn't know what to get you because you have so many awards, and you will have a lot of awards. But I thought that this is the best award I can ever give you because this puts you the alphabet because you are teaching your students and university how to read the real alphabet and the real definition alphabet and to take the best out of it. You have the cedar because you have planted through your alumni, the cedar of Lebanon in every single part of the world. And you will still, still planted that three cedars. You have the Phoenician ship because through your alumni, you are creating entrepreneurs, not in the university, nor in Lebanon, but all over the world. And this is exactly what is the core of alumni. And we have the pillars of Balbex. We are the pillar of our economy. And this means that despite the point where we started and the problems, we will reach the only point of confidence and trust and change. Dr. Jabra, I just want to give you that from all my heart. I am, if I may say a word, I am absolutely humbled by this beautiful gift. I don't deserve it myself. I think, <laughs> I, think, I think this is a gift for each and every one of you. This is a gift asking you to take care of LAU because LAU has taken care of all of us. And if it is to continue to take care of all of us, we must continue to stand by it. LAU stood by us when things were very, very enriching to all of us in terms of education during the times of crisis. LAU needs all of us to stand by it. So, my dear friend, Thank you so much for your thoughtfulness. Thank you very much for your friendship. Thank you very much for what you're doing for LAU as a member of the Board of Trustees. And thank you for all that you're doing for our beloved Lebanon. Thank you all. Thank you. Dr. Zabra, I was one of yours. I was a student of LAU. I'm an alumni, 
but in the name of the Lebanese Business Person Association in the world that I'm very honored to be, I'm giving you now our pen because you are becoming one of ours. Thank you. Thank you so much. Where is this? Where is this? Where is this? Where is this? Where is Thank you so much. Thank you all. Thank you.